Okay, I think I'm going to start because I have got already so many questions via email, so I want to make the best out of our time. So good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to the from the ANU Center for Arab and Islamic Studies. Um, I'm Karim Alashir. I'm the director of the center. I'm also the moderator of this uh, event. I would like to start by paying my respect to the Nonawal and Nambri people of the Canberra region and to all the First Nation Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and work. So when we conceived this event, the situation was very alarming um, between Ukraine and Russia, but things have moved quite um, in a very dangerous turn as there is a full scale Russian invasion of the country um, at the moment. I've just heard that um, the Russian military is very close to Kyiv. Um, this war, of course, is very multidimensional and has serious repercussions for the region and globally. With, this, with us to discuss this crisis are two of the best ANU experts on Russian and Eurasian politics, Kirill Norshanov um, and Matthew Essex. Kirill is based at the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies, the Middle East and Central Asia, at the School of Arts and Social Sciences. And Matthew Essex is based at the Strategic and Defense Studies Center at the ANU um, College of Asia and the Pacific. Without further ado, uh, since we need every minute of our time uh, this afternoon, I will invite Matthew and Carol to offer us insight and reflection for about 15 minutes each, um, and then we will open the floor for Q&A. Please mute yourselves and turn off your videos um, to ensure that everyone can join in the event because we've got a large audience of over 300 uh, registered for this event. And please make sure to send me your, qu your questions either via the chat um, function or wait till the Q&A um, slot and then you can unmute yourself, raise your hands, unmute yourself and ask the questions. Thank you all for your uh, cooperation and I'll start with you, Matthew. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, thank you so very much, Karima, and uh, good to see such an enormous turnout for, uh, for an event like this. Uh, would that everything uh, that had anything to do with Russia uh, generated such a, such a huge turnout, but obviously uh, something of, of great interest to people. Um, I won't take up too much time. Uh, I'll thought, I thought I would just briefly uh, talk about three things. Uh, one, the origins uh, of this uh, conflict. Uh, second, uh, the aims that Vladimir Putin might have, uh, and third, how he's going with that, um, and uh, and what some of the implications might be, um, and uh, and then uh, obviously happy to uh, to take uh, questions after Kirill's had a go, and he'll obviously be far more erudite than I am. Um, in terms of causes of conflict, it's fairly customary uh, in political science and international relations to talk about three different types of causes. Deep causes or structural causes, so-called intermediate causes uh, for wars, and then uh, triggering causes. So in other words, the, the actual sort of attack, uh, what causes an actual attack. Um, and I think it's important to uh, to look at two kinds of stories here uh, about uh, how this invasion of Ukraine has come about. Um, the first version of the story uh, comes from uh, the Russian Federation, comes from uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, and uh, it is effectively that uh, Russia has been uh, backed into a corner for years and years and years by a West that was, uh, if not, actively trying to marginalize, weaken, and overthrow the Russian government, then at the very least uh, trying to uh, ignore its problems. Um, this uh, narrative has been around for a, a very long time. In fact, it's a narrative that, uh, although it was not quite as nationalistic and vitriolic, it's a narrative that you can find starting in about 1992, 1993. Uh, it certainly uh, is not something that was the invention of Vladimir Putin, although, of course, he has amplified it considerably. Um, back in the early 1990s, you had uh, people like Andrei Kozilev, the uh, former foreign minister of the Russian Federation under Boris Yeltsin, uh, going off to uh, the CSCE, as it was then, the Conference for Security and Co uh, Cooperation in Europe, uh, and giving a speech uh, which sounded uh, straight out of the pages of, of Russian ultranationalism. Uh, he stood up uh, at the lectern and he said, Russia regards uh, all of the former Soviet republics as post-imperial space. Uh, we reserve our rights to uh, exercise 
uh, sphere of influence over those countries. Uh, if anyone else wants to threaten us, then we will use the, the full might of, uh, of our disposal with our military and up to and including nuclear weapons. And uh, he finished the speech and left the room. Uh, everybody was stunned. Um, and uh, he then came back and he said, well, what I, I just did was, uh, you know, a sham. It was obviously a ruse, a, a joke, if you like. Um, but he said, this is where it's going to go if Russia's concerns aren't taken seriously. Um, a few years later, uh, Yevgeny Primakov, the uh, former foreign minister and former prime minister uh, of Russia, had another go at explaining Russian concerns about NATO expansion. And uh, he used a counterfactual. Uh, and he said, OK, well, let's consider that uh, the Cold War's over. And in fact, it's the Warsaw Pact that wins, not NATO. Um, the United States says, well, what are you going to do? Um, and the Warsaw, Warsaw Pact says, well, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, unify Germany uh, under a Warsaw Pact uh, flag, but we don't have any intention to expand. And the United States says, can we join? And the Warsaw Pact says, no, not yet. We're a defensive alliance, though. You have nothing to fear from us. Um, and then France petitions for membership in the Warsaw Pact and is accepted. And the United Kingdom petitions for war, uh, membership in the Warsaw Pact and is accepted. And the United States says, well, what's going on? Um, and uh, the Kremlin says, oh, don't worry. You know, we're expanding purely for defensive purposes. Can we join? No, you can't join. Uh, and then Mexico petitions for member membership in the Warsaw Pact, uh, and then so does uh, Canada. And Primakov's argument was, well, you know, under those circumstances, wouldn't you feel left out? Uh, wouldn't you feel as though perhaps this was a threat to your security? Now, Putin, as I mentioned, has turned this from um, a series of objections into uh, perhaps even outright fascination. Um, with uh, an obsession, perhaps, uh, with NATO expansion. So the, uh, the, uh, the other side of the story, then, uh, about the origins of this crisis is that Russia has not been backed into a corner at all. It's been uh, Vladimir Putin. It's been the, um, effectively, radicalization uh, of the Siloviki around him um, who uh, push him, well, not push him, actually, who go along with him, um, towards, uh, you know, uh, conflict and war and basically a neo-imperial posture, expand Russia's territorial footprint. So those are the two stories. Um, who is right? Um, to be honest, I, I'm not completely sure that either side is completely right. Um, I spent the majority of my career, and I've been watching Russia for about 30 years now, um, I spent the majority of my career, in the, at least in the early stages, um, thinking that the, the Russian line was right, that NATO expansion was uh, a very bad thing, that it uh, made Russia more insecure. Over about the last 10 years, however, I've had a bit of a change of heart on that, um, so much so that uh, probably have become one of Australia's more hawkish people uh, when it comes to, to the Russian Federation's uh, uh, supposed security concerns when it comes to NATO. Uh, and there are a variety of reasons I'd give for that. Uh, one reason is that it's quite clear that you know, Ukraine itself uh, or you know, Estonia or the, even the NATO alliance does not threaten Russian security. It doesn't threaten the security of the Russian state because Russia has 6,000 nuclear weapons. It has more nuclear warheads than anyone else. Uh, and its security, frankly, is entirely assured by the fact that it is such a big nuclear power. So I think that uh, the threat, if there is one from NATO, is much less of a, a threat from an alliance uh, of uh, the military security type. I think it's more of a normative threat. I think it's more uh, a threat to the regime of Putin. Uh, and the reason I think that, in particular, I think is demonstrated by uh, Putin's uh, very odd essay which he published, uh, supposedly wrote, uh, there is disagreement about whether he did write it, but published halfway through last year, in which he basically said that Ukrainians and Russians were one people. There is no such thing as a Ukrainian. Uh, we are being kept apart by uh, the evil NATO, the evil West, and so forth. Um, if that was odd, then certainly his meeting with his Security Council uh, and his subsequent uh, angry speech 
justifying why Luhansk and Donetsk need to be incorporated, sorry, need to be recognized as little statelets uh, was, I think, something that provided further evidence. And in it, effectively, he denied Ukraine sovereignty and identity. Uh, and uh, he placed the blame squarely uh, at the feet of the rogue regime, basically uh, saying that since the protests in the Euromaidan, Ukraine has not been a sovereign actor and doesn't deserve it anyway. Uh, made all sorts of odd uh, suggestions from history, such as, well, Lenin created Ukraine, nonsense, uh, praised Stalin, said Ukraine was getting nuclear weapons. It seemed you know, you know, straight out of the, the Russian ultra-nationalist playbook. Uh, and then, of course, there was the speech he gave, uh, which was declaring a war, uh, effectively, uh, declaring he was invading Ukraine, in which he went over very similar ground. Interestingly enough, of course, he was wearing the same suit, the same tie, and his shirt had the same wrinkles in it. And if you looked at the metadata, it was filmed on exactly the same day as he held his Security Council meeting. So this was entirely pre-cooked. Uh, therefore, I think that, uh, you know, the cause of, of the conflict is Putin's desire to expand a territorial footprint. He is, in fact, pushing closer to NATO rather than getting, uh, rather than trying to move further away from it. He's established a strategic, you know, footprint in Belarus, takes away the notion that Belarus has strategic autonomy by the fact that he has now 30,000 troops there who are going to stay indefinitely, and he virtually controls Lukashenko. Uh, following the sham elections of, uh, of last year and the brutal crackdown against them. Um, and I think he probably does want to carve out some space in Ukraine um, for, uh, if not Russia proper, uh, then little statelets. Um, Russia tends to be now surrounded by ceasefires and statelets uh, that uh, he can control um, and, uh, you know, uh, effectively um, increase his, uh, his geopolitical size. Um, as to what he wants, um, I'll be very brief with this. Um, there are three possible things he wants. One is what he said he wanted, and that is the territory of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, or at least protecting that territory. Interestingly enough, of course, uh, he has chosen to uh, support what the Kremlin-backed separatists there claim rather than what they control. Um, prior to the onset of hostilities, 70% of that territory was controlled by the Ukrainian army. So that is a, a much bigger geographical area. Uh, now, he says that's all he wants. Uh, however, he also says that he is going to um, demilitarize Ukraine and denazify Ukraine. Again, a very common uh, Russian nationalistic trope that says Ukraine is ruled by Nazis. Um, and, uh, and is, uh, you know, a horrible far right wing state. Um, it's the denazification thing that will be particularly odious to uh, those who study Ukrainian politics, given that Zelensky himself is Jewish, um, it comes from a Jewish family. Um, uh, and more than that, it basically says, uh, I'm going to do regime change. And uh, when a member of the State Duma uh, Nikonov was uh, interviewed yesterday. He said, we are going to put in place a uh, regime friendly uh, to the Kremlin, uh, to Russia. Uh, so I think it's fairly obvious that Putin wants more than simply uh, independence for uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. Um, US intelligence on this has been correct for once. Um, and uh, interesting that it's been shared uh, with the world before Putin invaded. Um, as to how it's going, well, probably not as well as he thought it was going to go, um, at least initially. Now, there's a long time, uh, obviously, a long time for this to play out, but at least the first 24 hours would suggest that um, Russia has not achieved all of its military objectives that it would have had for day one, uh, including in particular a very audacious bid to capture the airfield, the main military airfield uh, near Kiev uh, using VDV special forces. Uh, paratroopers, um, and that would have allowed Russia to reinforce um, its position very close to the Ukrainian capital. Um, I rather suspect that what the plan was was to get into Kiev quickly, uh, to capture Zelensky, to capture those who were on kill lists and either execute them or imprison them, uh, and then install a friendly regime. Um, they probably will, Russia probably will end up doing that. Um, uh, it depends what happens with, with Zelensky, whether he gets out or not. Um, 
they probably will end up doing that, uh, but it'll take them some time and they're going to have to use tanks. Um, and uh, that raises a question, I guess, also for the Ukrainian military, and that is, do we engage in urban warfare uh, in Kiev, in Kharkiv, in uh, you know, various other places? Uh, because uh, the Russians aren't mucking around. Um, they've brought thermobaric weapons, basically fuel air explosives, um, that will decimate entire city blocks. And if they start using those, then the civilian casualties will be absolutely horrendous. Uh, but that's my assessment of the sort of origins, uh, Putin's intentions and, uh, and how it's going. Um, and with that, let me hand over to Kira. Thank you, Matthew. That was wonderful. Please, Kirill. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Karima. Matthew, as always, you are magisterial in, in your analysis. And uh, uh, in preparation for this event, of course, uh, which started about 10 days ago, the idea was that uh, Matthew will be the voice of reason and I'll be a quasi Putin stooge trying to uh, rationalize uh, Moscow's behavior. Um, unfortunately, the past 24 hours uh, rendered this task completely impossible for me because uh, um, uh, really what Putin is doing right now, what has been doing, what he has been doing in the past uh, 24 hours uh, uh, seemed genuinely unthinkable to me. I honestly believe that he would not cross the line, he would not opt for an invasion. Uh, I uh, did believe that uh, he'll end up recognizing uh, the independence of Donbass and uh, uh, well, Luhansk and Donetsk, but he wouldn't cross the red line. Unfortunately, it happened. And uh, all this bloodshed and violence is solely the doing of Putin. It's uh, his agency, it's uh, his choice. Uh, still, I'm uh, trying to um, uh, come to terms with uh, uh, this kind of behavior with, without really resorting to uh, psychoanalysis or um, uh, drawing uh, long-reaching parallels with imperial hubris of uh, uh, Putin. And uh, as uh, uh, Peter Dutton did a couple of weeks ago in a moment of uh, uh, uncharacteristic eloquence, he said, Putin is about to become a septuagenarian. He wants that to go down history books as an achiever of things. So hence his uh, behavior is becoming increasingly irrational. Um, actually, I had a sleepless night. I thought maybe there is indeed something deranged, something uh, phantasmagoric about Putin's disposition. Uh, but upon reflection, I uh, am still prepared to uh, cut uh, put in some slack in a very negative, very critical way. And uh, I do believe that uh, uh, whatever is happening in Ukraine now at the hands of the um, uh, Russian military is still uh, fairly rational and it is still motivated by uh, uh, considerations of some national security interest, not by the reconstruction of the USSR or the Russian empire Mark II or by uh, Putin's um, uh, megalomania. And uh, the uh, reason uh, I'm uh, convinced, well, not convinced, I'm uh, tilting to think uh, this way, is uh, actually uh, the signals, are the signals coming from Moscow, from the Kremlin right about now. And uh, after this aggression commenced, uh, in the past 20, well, not 20, for 12 hours probably, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov and uh, Dmitry Peskov, uh, speaking on behalf of Putin, said, uh, well, we're actually we're prepared to talk. Uh, what is at stake is really uh, the neutrality of Ukraine and uh, uh, the uh, diffusion of this uh, NATO's uh, uh, creep uh, eastwards and all that. Uh, and, uh, well, it's... Uh, there is no jingoism and uh, no this uh, um, super patriotic ultranationalist talk that accompanied the adventure in Crimea in 2014, uh, for example. So, but uh, taking a step back, unlike Matthew, I cannot claim that uh, I have been watching Russian politics uh, for uh, 30 years. My kettle of fish is really Central Asia, uh, the former Soviet republics and uh, Afghanistan. and. Uh, uh, my reading of what possessed Putin and what compelled Moscow to go for such extraordinary and violent and ultimately counterproductive uh, length uh, uh, has, I think, a historical parallel in uh, the Soviet decision to invade Afghanistan in 1979. 
uh, because uh, now we know that it was not Brescia's megalomania, neither it was uh, the desire for uh, imperial expansion towards the Indian Ocean, it was all security driven. But uh, the Soviet Union badly miscalculated in uh, parrying uh, this uh, largely imaginary threat or overblown threat of the combination of uh, uh, radicals, uh, turban headed ruffians, hooligans who were probing at the um, uh, Soviet Union's uh, underbelly, and uh, the American protrusion from Pakistan in the direction of Central Asia again. So, thus, um, uh, the uh, second element of that fateful decision in 1979 to resort to crude violence was uh, the perception in Moscow that, uh, well, we have nothing to lose really. The relations with the West are so bad and are getting worse because Carter is uh, winding down the detente and uh, Pershing missiles are about to be deployed in Europe uh, and sanctions are coming out our way. So, well, what do we have to lose? So th hence uh, the troops went in like a ton of bricks. And we all know the story, how it unfolded. Uh, of course, the Soviet Union achieved its security objectives in a weird, extremely violent way, but then it had to pay a colossal price uh, and uh, uh, the adventure in Afghanistan uh, is widely regarded as one of the factors contributing to the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so I think this parallel is valid and uh, the Russian leadership in its uh, finite wisdom decided that the threat from Ukraine is very real. It's actually gaining momentum. Uh, Matthew made a very interesting um, uh, point about the uh, distinction between sy systemic reasons for the conflict and the trigger points, trigger events. And Putin uh, already himself said that one of the trigger points for the major escalation has been Zelensky's quite unwise comment that Ukraine is going to get nuclear weapons again. Uh, that, that was noticed in the Kremlin. Uh, an earlier um, uh, trigger point was uh, the new military doctrine published by Zelensky in March 2021, which uh, basically said not only Ukraine will join NATO, Ukraine will help NATO in waging a hybrid warfare against Russia. So this uh, certainly uh, set the alarm bells uh, ringing in Moscow, and that's perhaps what triggered the initial deployment, uh, amassment of Russian troops on you know, Ukraine's border. So thus, um, I think Matthew is absolutely correct uh, that uh, Russia could have achieved neutrality of uh, Ukraine, or let's say non-membership of Ukraine in NATO through other means, through this uh, hardball diplomacy brinkmanship, uh, uh, we kind of anticipated this. Why Putin went uh, with the troops in still remains to be uh, seen. And uh, here, uh, like Matthew, I uh, can venture three scenarios, uh, perhaps in the reverse uh, likelihood of the implementation compared to Matthew's analysis. Uh, so the worst case scenario, Putin wants to deny Ukraine sovereignty, wants to append Ukraine as uh, kind of uh, a new province to the Russian Federation. Uh, so total occupation and uh, subjugation. Uh, the second uh, scenario is that indeed it's all about regime change. Uh, Zelensky will be out of office, some kind of puppet government will be installed in Kiev. Uh, the third one actually, and uh, I don't have a crystal ball, I don't have confidence in this scenario at all, but I hope against hope that's uh, uh, what Putin thinks really. Uh, so Putin will capture additional territory in Ukraine, uh, perhaps will take some uh, regional centers, uh, not Kiev, it, it will be extremely difficult uh, for the Russian military. And then uh, he will bargain uh, for a new settlement with the West with the government of uh, Ukraine as well. Only this time, it will not just be about non-membership in NATO and uh, neutrality. The stakes has been uh, increased by Putin. Now he added on a couple more items. And this is uh, uh, recognition of uh, Russian sovereignty over Crimea. And of course, ironclad uh, guarantees to the now independent republics of um, uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. So thus, um, there is still a chance for diplomacy. Putin uh, seems to have a very uh, strong set of cards in his hands right now, tactically. But uh, strategically and in the, in the longish perspective, midterm to long-term perspective, it may backfire spectacularly for 
Russia and will create enormous problems for uh, Putin internationally and even domestically. Uh, Matthew already hinted at this, that uh, mm, uh, what when we discuss anything that Putin does and basically the contours, the uh, trajectory of the um, uh, Russian foreign policy, uh, we should uh, pay close attention to what the locals say and think. And it's not just the Russian elite, it's also the Russian people. And uh, the fact on the ground that it's measured by public opinion polls in Russia is that the war, this uh, belligerent attitude of Putin is unpopular in Russia. Um, uh, in one of the recent polls, uh, the question was asked of ordinary Russians, well, uh, how do you assess Putin's foreign policy? And the Russians gave Putin thumbs up say, on the count of standing up to NATO. Yes, he's a good man ensuring our physical security against the repetition of the Serbia scenario or uh, whatever. The same poll revealed that uh, when it came to Ukraine, it, it, Putin was voted down that uh, his acrimonious relationship with uh, Ukraine, his inability to reach some kind of uh, sensible compromise, persuade uh, Kiev to assume a neutral stance uh, uh, is regarded by the Russians as, uh, as, as a failure. So hence uh, this uh, um, attempt to force uh, neutrality with uh, uh, pompons on uh, will not go down, or is not going down well with the Russian public. And we see already demonstrations in uh, dozens of Russian cities. They are small, but they will grow in size. And the Russians are protesting not because of their fear of uh, nuclear economic sanctions coming from the West, uh, but of course, it's the moral outrage. The Russians uh, do not have hatreds towards the Ukrainians. Um, uh, Matthew mentioned uh, Putin's forays into um, some idiosyncratic reading of history, which is really weird and bizarre. But on the other hand, uh, if you think about this, uh, the Russians and the Ukrainians are like this. They know a lot about each other, they intermarry, and uh, it's difficult really to separate uh, what happens in one country from what happens in another country, but they all want peace and Putin is the violator of peace and that will rebound badly on him. Uh, the final comment I would like to make, and it's uh, again, in no way exonerates uh, Putin's uh, aggressiveness is, uh, uh, in my opinion, there were so many opportunities to prevent what has eventuated. And uh, uh, the, uh, my perception is uh, that uh, for an awfully long period of time, the West was not taking uh, Russia seriously. It was kind of, uh, you know, derisory sneering, oh, well, the Russians, what do you expect from them? Uh, Putin in a fit of uh, anger escalates the situation. They will just threaten him with sanctions. He'll go away, it will blow, uh, blow over, uh, she'll be right, might. Of course, uh, this was a complete and utter misreading of the seriousness of uh, Russia's intentions. It was not uh, Putin, it was actually Medvedev, the liberal one, who advanced the idea that Russia is entitled to a sphere of privileged interests in the former Soviet Union. Uh, did the West react to this in some kind of uh, robust military way, drawing a line saying, no, 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 it's, it's um, it all goes on, no. And the, conversely, uh, the same president of the Russian Federation, Dmitry Medvedev, uh, um, uh, made uh, an offer to the collective West uh, in 2010, most recently, uh, let's sit down, let's negotiate, let's uh, rejuvenate the Helsinki process and make the OEC, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, as a um, collective uh, mechanism that will ensure the absence of war and conflict uh, in uh, uh, Eurasia. He was thrown down like a bad spread. Uh, the West simply did not listen. So th thus, uh, the West neither deployed uh, some kind of forceful argument in terms of deterring uh, Russia's ambition in the former Soviet Union, nor it tried to reach an accommodation uh, with Russia, perhaps a reasonable quid pro quo, who knows how it may have uh, uh, panned out. And uh, just to conclude on a uh, clever authoritative note, uh, that's exactly what uh, George Cannon incidentally advised when he uh, talked about firm and vigilant containment of the Soviet Union and by inference, uh, uh, Russia. Do not misunderestimate them, study them, listen to the signals coming from them. Uh, sometimes you have to be brutal, 
for them. Sometimes you need to uh, compromise. Unfortunately, again, this sneering derision and uh, the uh, absence of attention and reactive nature of Western policies who suddenly woke uh, up to the realization that 200,000 troops are enveloping Ukraine. Uh, this is uh, a tragic lesson that uh, will be rectified in the future one way or the other. So thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, that's really a lot of food for thought, uh, Matthew and Kirill. I've already got um, many questions on the chat box and also um, I've got a few questions coming via email um, by colleagues who couldn't join us live. So uh, you've answered a few of the questions. Um, one recurrent question about was about the Russian public opinion. Is it behind uh, Putin or not. I think you've addressed that very clearly, um, Kirill. One question that has been asked by many is about the role of China. It is um, uh, many experts, including yourselves, uh, would say that the only person uh, um, Putin would listen to is the Chinese um, uh, president and because they have this kind of special relationship. Do you what what role do you see China playing in this um, war? Um, and related to that, another um, colleague is asking, would China use this opportunity to invade Taiwan, like to use the same, you know, the same parameter of territorial uh, expansion and ambition? So and then this, the second question, I'll just give you a few so that you can address it is about um, the implications for Russia itself, within Russia itself, you know, what kind of implications you see for the country. Um, and one um, um, repeated question time and again is about the political economy of this conflict. Is Putin, I have this on email and, and in the chat box, is Putin using this um, to make use of um, uh, or to manipulate the market economy. Um, uh, there were sanctions imposed by the European Union and the US, but they were shrugged off um, in a kind of a funny way, like, you know, so what? Um, how do you see the political of economy of this conflict uh, playing out in the short and long uh, term, particularly with that um, uh, gas pipe um, from, that was initiated and now stopped by Germany? How do you see the implication that for, and not only the Russian and the Eurasian economy, but the global, the global economy at large. So if you can please kindly start with this, I have loads to um, put to you through. Thank you so much to both. Uh, okay, um, that, that's a, a lot to deal with. I'll, I, I might cherry pick some of them um, because I wasn't taking notes. So um, I'll, I'll, let me start with China, shall I? Um, <laughs> Look, um, will China take the opportunity to invade Taiwan? No. Um, China will, if it does decide to invade Taiwan, it'll do it based on its own perceptions of what its interests are uh, and based on timing that, you know, it considers to, to be right. I think we uh, need to be very careful in simply assuming that because countries are authoritarian, they are not only um, in league with one another in terms of their ideas, but also micromanage their strategic policy. Um, this has popped up recently. It's absolute complete fiction. Um, it may well be that, uh, and China certainly does have designs on Taiwan, but that it would be affected by Russia or some kind of master plan, I think is uh, best left in the realms of fantasy. That said, um, I think China, and there's another argument, I think it's a more serious one that says, you know, China is the only country that stands to benefit out of all this, um, because it will see that the heat is being taken off it, the United States uh, under the Biden administration and even the Trump administration as well, uh, turned its attention very much to, uh, to China, whether a trade war with China or strenuous competition with China. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously this, this takes the, the Biden's attention, Biden administration's attention away to some extent. Um, yeah, there are aspects of that that's true, but the US hasn't exactly been covering itself with, you know, glory in terms of, of coming up with an operational Indo-Pacific strategy, modernizing its Indo-Pacific fleet, uh, and most importantly, coming up with an economic counter to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so the extent to which, you know, China will be thrilled with all this, you know, yeah, to some extent, but China will also be irritated. China will privately be very irritated with what the Russians are doing here. Uh, they certainly weren't happy with uh, what happened in Crimea uh, and made no secret that they were cross about that. 
Um, the Chinese also had interests in uh, Ukraine uh, in terms of uh, Belt and Road connectivity. Uh, and uh, Ukraine's number one trading partner is China. Um, so uh, the Chinese will, will not be pleased with that. They certainly also won't be pleased with Moscow because Moscow tends to go around doing now a lot of intervening uh, and yet claims that it is you know, one of the torchbearers of, of non-intervention, Article 2 of the UN Charter. And of course, that's central to Chinese messaging as well, associated with its rise which is, okay, we will rise peacefully, you know, we won't pose a threat to you, you won't pose a threat to us, no one will, we will all respect each other's sovereignty. So um, that's the aspect of the sort of, you know, China dimension as far as I'd uh, I'd go. What were some of the other ones, Karima? Um, about the political economy of the conflict. Uh, um, um, look, Kirill probably knows more about this than I do, but of course, Russia has had experience with sanctions. Um, so it divested away from US dollars and it bought gold instead. Um, and it has a fairly big sovereign wealth fund uh, that it, I think, thinks that it can ride out sanctions. Um, I'm not quite sure it's going to be able to do that for a huge amount of time. Depends how long the international community wants to uh, remain united, uh, because it will dwindle those reserves very, very quickly indeed. Um, if it is faced not just with, you know, the inability of any of its banks to raise capital. Um, in US dollars or in Europe, uh, but also things like export controls in the tech sector, export controls in mining, uh, all these areas which the Russian government relies on very much uh, are going to, to be hit and hurt so that there will be pain for Russians as a result of this decision. And when you combine that with the fact that less than 20, 25% of the population actually agree that war with Ukraine is a good thing, uh, that may well have pressure, uh, generate some pressure, even though, of course, Putin is not beholden to uh, electors at the ballot box the way he might be here uh, or elsewhere. Thank you, Matthew. Kirill, would you all like right. to... Well, uh, I absolutely agree with Matthew's analysis of uh, where China stands on all this. Uh, uh, just to validate this uh, a bit further, uh, the joint statement of Putin and Xi, uh, dating back to the 4th of February, made it very clear. China stands with Russia on the issue of NATO. China completely uh, buys ru the Russian narrative. Uh, NATO expansion is what is bad. And uh, they stand sh shoulder to shoulder to this Western uh, aggressive conduct. Uh, China is absolutely uh, irritated by the recognition of the uh, separatist uh, republics. And China will not, of course, recognize uh, the um, uh, appending of new territories should it happen, just like it refused to uh, recognize uh, the um, uh, annexation of Crimea. Um, uh, I am not sure what's going to happen to Taiwan. Of course, I find Matthew's comment uh, yeah, credible there. Now, in terms of political economy, first starting with the Nord Stream Pipeline uh, project, uh, unless something uh, happened over the past 12 uh, hours, uh, the German position is uh, uh, we are pausing the pipeline. I think the, the German word is jetzt. So for the... Uh, uh, time being, uh, in, well, indefinitely or until such time that the crisis is resolved. Uh, but effectively, yes, it's going to be put on hold. It's uh, not going to uh, generate income to uh, the Russian Federation anytime soon. Having said that, the cost of the pipeline was uh, between 11 and $15 billion. Russia had more than recouped the, that cost of construction already through higher gas prices over the past uh, year. And uh, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, who is... Uh, they're pretty much in the outer circle of Putin now. The, uh, he uh, made a very interesting statement uh, uh, the other day saying that uh, we don't really care, Nord Stream uh, uh, working or not working, uh, with this crisis propelling uh, natural gas prices uh, in the region of 2,000 euros per a thousand uh, cubic meters. We are not worried. We're going to uh, make a big buck, if not in uh, Europe, then in Southeast Asia. Uh, maybe it's just fighting words. Maybe uh, depending on the market volatility, you know, Russia will uh, be hit for six in this energy sector. But uh, uh, at the moment, it's all the cocky speech and uh, supreme confidence. Uh, Matthew mentioned the sovereign wealth fund, uh, the cushion that uh, Moscow has amassed, and it's. Uh, uh, 635 billion dollars 
uh, which will last uh, the Russian economy and social uh, welfare payments uh, for well over a year. Uh, by comparison, so the most nuclear of the economic sanctions mild at the moment in the West is uh, Russia's disconnection from SWIFT. Um, some assessments uh, put the cumulative damage from this act at $50 billion. So can Russia ride over this unpleasantness? Probably it can. Of course, uh, there are extra considerations like uh, Russia can no longer borrow money in the West, but again, Mm, it's uh, survivable. So um, uh, uh, it's, uh, in the, there is no immediate prospect of uh, Russia changing its behavior because of economic hardship. Uh, the midterm perspective, so three to five years and further down the track, if the Iron Curtain descends uh, uh, again, and if uh, Russia cannot uh, tap into global finances and especially global technology, uh, this, will, this will hurt Russia big time. And, uh, uh, but uh, who knows, uh, does Putin think in the categories of uh, a week uh, from now, a month from our posterity, we just uh, uh, don't know. So thanks. Thank you. I, I suppose the question there is also with the, the way it will hurt the world economy, you know, with the rise of uh, prices of oil and the struggle of many countries to keep uh, oil subsidies in place. That would have serious repercussions for many countries around the world, particularly with the um, as we're coming out of COVID. But we can go back to that as well. I see one raised hand. Um, Taylor, would you like to unmute yourself um, and ask the question and then I'll carry on with the chat box. Thank you, Taylor. All right. Uh, thanks very much. And thank you to you guys for hosting such an awesome event for people like me to gain insight into such a current world issue. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, moving on to my question. I know we've kind of touched on this, but I was just wondering, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, but what conclusion do you guys see coming if Russia would be successful with their uh, military objectives in the Ukraine, which it seems like they probably will be? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Taylor. Um, Matthew and uh, Kirill, do you want another question to go with that? Um, yeah, yeah, let's have another yeah. one. Yeah, so um, I think you've addressed this question about anti the anti-war movement in Russia, how significant it is, particularly if there are more Russian casualties as we go along um, um, with the conflict. But one other question that I think is recurrent and I received quite few via email is what role can NATO play um, I mean, they've been very good at threatening. Uh, are they going to um, pursue that line of and do something with those threats, or is it just like empty threats, uh, as we've seen also from the European Union? Um, and what role can, um, or the United States, what role can the United States contribute to the current situation? Are they trying to pursue the road of diplomacy, but also there, there was some strong um, threatening um, words from. Um, the president. So could you please address those and then um, briefly, because I've got quite a lot of questions coming. Thank you so much. Um, what will NATO do militarily? Nothing. Um, they've already said they're going to do nothing. Um, but, uh, repeatedly, in fact. Uh, and it's one of the things that I think is been a bit problematic in terms of managing Putin, is that it gives him a green light. Um, Putin's calculation. Now, I, look, I, I was one of the few people who uh, said, yeah, I think Putin will go in to Ukraine. I think he will fight. And I'd have to take absolutely no comfort whatsoever in being correct about that. But it's, um, I mean, my assessment would be that the Western approach uh, to Russia, at least initially after the end of the Cold War, was probably far too harsh, far too dismissive. Um, but its response um, after Crimea has been far too weak. Uh, and uh, the product, frankly, of successive administrations kicking the can down the road and thinking the Russia problem will just go away. Uh, well, Putin has made that decisive. It's an inflection point, I think, for the West and uh, really needs to decide how it's going to step up or not with relation to Russia. Uh, now, Biden has said he will defend and protect every centimeter or inch, of course, it being America, of NATO territory. That territory might get bigger. It's interesting that Finland and Sweden are joining the uh, emergency discussions uh, with the NATO Council, I think today or tomorrow. Uh, and there is a strong push from the Finns, uh, Finnish MPs to, uh, to join NATO. It may be, in fact, you know, when we talk about some of the strategic effects or longer term effects for Putin's that 
one of the counterproductive things he makes NATO bigger and he makes NATO more uh, united. The addition of countries like Sweden and Finland, those that have had, you know, the closer to Russia you are, uh, the more wary you are, I think, of, uh, uh, of uh, Russian intentions. And I think the less um, likely you are to buy arguments that you can trade your way to peace, which has been the sort of German approach. And certainly, I think, to some extent, the French and Italian approach, too. Uh, so um, does that kind of answer some of those questions? Yep. I'll let you yep. go. Uh, again, I uh, cannot fail to agree with Matthew's analysis. Uh, so uh, tactically for the short run, Putin may have parried the NATO threat. Long-term implications are absolutely gruesome and grim for Russia. So, but uh, the first question was about uh, Russia's military objectives. And uh, mm, uh, again, uh, why I am sort of uh, not convinced that the objective is uh, uh, physical control and occupation of the whole of Ukraine, or even regime change. It's again, it's historical precedent. Uh, 2008, the five day war with Georgia, Russian troops were poised on the uh, uh, really outskirts approaches to the national capital, Belize, they could have uh, taken that uh, low hanging fruit. Georgia is much smaller than uh, Ukraine, they didn't. They achieved their objectives, destroyed the military infrastructure. Uh, NATO trained forces of Georgia were absolutely pulverized. Uh, then they withdrew. But of course, uh, loitering with intent in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, ensuring good behavior of Georgia in the future. So uh, I think that's actually a more likely scenario for Ukraine in the future. So the conflict may become frozen uh, indefinitely, but at least in this crude, very horrible way Putin will ensure um, uh, Ukraine's neutrality or non-membership in NATO. Um, uh, the US role and the, uh, in uh, deterring Putin and uh, changing his belligerent behavior, uh, Matthew <laughs> said emphatic no. I would add actually, uh, it was cringeworthy for me to, to hear the message from London, uh, from Boris, Johnson's, Boris Johnson, all Ukrainians fight for your freedom. But we'll, 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 we'll give you moral encouragement, maybe throw in some arms, but you fight. We stay away from all this. So um, in uh, Russia and Ukraine, there's actually quite a, a, a cynical proverb in circulation that uh, uh, the West is prepared to fight Russia in Ukraine until the last Ukrainian soldier. And uh, uh, this is, uh, again, this is exactly the signal that encouraged Putin perhaps to step over the red line because he understood there'll be, there'll be no military consequences for him uh, doing this. Uh, finally, the Russian behavior being uh, uh, an example of a threat to all and sundry, you bet. And uh, just this harsh silence in uh, the capitals of the former Soviet republics, including in Central Asia, is such a great uh, testimony to this. Uh, they uh, do not dare to, like, even uh, uh, raise concerns about Russia's behavior. It's uh, uh, deathly silence. Uh, they're cowering, thinking, well, well, Putin says that the Ukraine is an exception. Russia expects everyone else's sovereignty in the former Soviet Union, but is it really the case? Great. I, there's another question about um, comparing this invasion to the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Um, I mean, there are for people like us who work on the Middle East, it actually brings quite, um, it's a powerful uh, question because they were both based on the idea of, um, um, you know, peacekeeping and spreading democracy. Um, the, the person who is asking the question is saying why there is such a, a different international reaction to both invasions, which is a very pertinent question. Um. I'm not sure there was a different international reaction to to both of them. I was certainly around for Iraq, and I remember when 150 of Tony Blair's own members of parliament voted against him. I um, suppose on the state level rather than the people, there were mass uh, protests in, in the UK against the war, um, mm. as well as in major European capitals. But I suppose the question is on the state level, because there's a lot of condemnation of the invasion of uh, Russia on state level rather than people level? Mm. Um, I'm not necessarily sure what the analogy is, frankly, given, uh, look, I'm not a Middle East expert, but 
Um, you know, I mean, if you're asking the question, you know, wasn't the US just as much to blame in going into Iraq as Russia into Ukraine? Yeah, sure. Um, absolutely. A stupid war. Um, it was based on faulty intelligence and faulty intelligence that was sold uh, to the West, um, you know, in a, in a quite blatant way. Um, and, uh, and it proved to be an abject failure. I think what makes this different is that uh, I mean, the problem with the Middle East is that the invasion of Iraq upset the Middle Eastern security order in that the US took away the one person that everybody agreed that they hated more than Israel um, and, uh, and in the form of Saddam Hussein. Um, Ukraine, uh, I'm not really sure, has, has been... Um, you know, doing an enormous amount to to threaten Russia. I mean, Kirill says, yeah, you know, it has a military doctrine where it says we'll contribute to hybrid and, uh, and all that kind of thing. Well, you know, Russia is the hybrid practitioner par excellence. Um, you only have to, to go to, you know, Stockholm or Helsinki or to Tallinn um, to, to, or to Warsaw to, you know, uh, experience the reach of, of Russian messaging, disinfo, propaganda, and so forth. Um, so in the Iraqi context or the Iraq war context, I don't think the United States was upsetting the international order uh, too much. Um, however, I do think that in going into Ukraine, uh, what Putin has done is gone into that sort of middle ground or quasi neutral type uh, region that now does, for better or worse, thrust the world back to about 1989 or possibly 1987 in terms of security alignment. So possibly 1997, depending on where you draw the lines. Um, and that, that poses a huge credibility question for, for NATO and for the United States, which is, well, what happens when Putin decides that the Poles don't deserve to exist as a sovereign country and they have no identity? Well, the Estonians have no identity. Uh, or the Lithuanians or Latvians, what happens then? Um, so I think that this is, you know, uh, something that's going to be profoundly shocking um, and, uh, and requires probably a response that's slightly more robust than the one we've seen so far. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll be quick. I think that actually there is actually merit to this uh, question mm. uh, and it yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, compels us to think about the changing nature of uh, uh, global international relations. Uh, uh, so in both cases, I think we have uh, a situation where a big power reacts to an adversary uh, under some kind of uh, cloud of uh, uh, hypertrophied uh, security uh, concern. Uh, except uh, the United States in 2003 was uh, a superpower in many ways. Uh, in 2003, it was uh, um, synonymous with uh, international law. I mean, of course, there, there were murmurs from old Europe and uh, uh, the criticism came from other quarters, but uh, America was a trendsetter. America decided what is right and what is uh, wrong under international law. Of course, there was subsequent atonement and mea culpa, but at the time it, 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 it was pretty obvious. Now, fast forward to 2022 and uh, Russia. Russia, by no stretch of imagination, despite its uh, 6,000 plus uh, uh, warheads, is a trendsetter upholder or interpreter of international law. So uh, obviously the um, uh, uh, criticism of Russian action would be much more uh, severe. Although I noticed that uh, uh, I can't explain this uh, food for thought the so-called uh, global international coalition against Putin is uh, struggling a bit. Of course, NATO and the collective West Australia uh, show solidarity, but uh, it's not just China. Look at India, Pakistan, uh, Gulf monarchies, Brazil, Argentina. Well, wh where are they? Why aren't they falling in line and this uh, uh, castigation and a problem to Putin? So perhaps the international order is not what it used to be in 2003. Russia could not have possibly attacked Ukraine in 2003. Well, in 2022, it just miscalculated perhaps, but uh, there'll be no uh, immediate um, uh, fallout threatening to Russia. Thank you. Thank you to both. Going back to the question of um, the role of um, other international organizations, there are a few questions on the role of um, the EU as well as the UN, what can the UN do? Um, given there was an emotional uh, message from the UN Secretary General 
um, uh, begging Russia to stop. Is there something else that they could do in practice, like kick Russia out of the Security Council? Probably most um, impossible. And the other question, Matthew, you spoke about um, Putin uh, pushing for so-called denazification of uh, Ukraine, given, as you said, the president is Jewish himself. What implication has that done for the region itself? Will that upset Germany? Um, one um, colleague is asking, but also has it got implication for Israel itself? Israel maintains very good relations with Ukraine. Uh, it has declared its respect for international law, which is very fascinating for uh, a country like um, Israel in breach of many international laws. But at the same time, um, it, the Israel relationship with Russia, um, it's very careful not to upset Russia. So what do you see the ramifications of these uh, issues? Um, thank you. Well, it's, it's put Israel in a kind of awkward position because um, on the one hand, uh, Israel vetoed uh, the, uh, the refused to request for Iron Dome missile systems, missile defense systems to go to uh, to Ukraine. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it's probably been lent on quite heavily by the United States, um, as well as, of course, having its own, you know, domestic, you know, political constituency, public opinion uh, requiring a response. So that's why they've come out and, and condemned Russian uh, behavior. Um, you know, other countries, India, Pakistan, yeah, you know, India has a good trading relationship with Russia. It's reliant on Russia for 60% of its military kit. Uh, where else is it going to get it? Uh, well, perhaps the US, but it costs more. Uh, and that's going to take time. Uh, Pakistan, yeah, you know, uh, Pakistan previously a massive mega recipient of US aid during the war on terror, now increasingly close to China. Imran Khan was, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in Moscow meeting Putin uh, and enthusing at what, uh, you know, uh, special times he was, uh, he, exciting times, I think he said, uh, that he was visiting in. Um, in terms of the, you know, what is it, what's the effect on Germany uh, of that kind of, uh, kind of language? No, I, I don't think it has a huge effect. Um, I think it has a, a sort of rhetorical effect that it will be assumed, okay, this is just the way that Putin does his messaging. And it's reflective of, you know, various Eurasianist, Duganite kind of tropes um, that you find in, in Russian politics and society. So uh, I don't think necessarily it's going to bite that deeply, even though people would find it deeply off-putting. Thank you. Kirill? Karim, I'll deal with the first question then, yeah. and uh, it's uh, international agency in uh, uh, finding a solution to the conflict. Uh, we have to distinguish between the immediate action and uh, uh, long-term action. And of course, uh, while we're sitting here in rainy Canberra, people are dying on the ground in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the EU, the United Nations, uh, unfortunately, can do very little about it uh, right now so, uh, in terms of immediate cessation of uh, violence. Um, uh, what uh, can and should and really ought to happen is some kind of international broker who has uh, enough uh, chutzpah and enough uh, credibility with all sides uh, to come in and do something about this. Uh, if you recall uh, in 2008, uh, as the Russians were closing on Belize, there was an angel of peace descending upon uh, the battlefield, and it was uh, uh, Sarkozy, the president of France. Uh, Macron is certainly not qualified to fulfill this role. He failed already when he tried to uh, engage in shuttle diplomacy. So it will have to be someone else. And uh, who can it be? A Nelson Mandela kind of uh, uh, peacemaker? I just don't know. Um, what I notice, though, is that uh, uh, the International Red Cross is already part of the action. And uh, in the best spirit of uh, impartiality and humanitarian um, uh, attitude, it uh, renders assistance to humanitarian assistance to people trapped both in, uh, in Donbass who are suffering from action from the Ukrainian forces. And of course, uh, in uh, the territories that are now being pummeled by uh, uh, the Russians. Uh, to what extent the ICRC can uh, reach an understanding, a ceasefire, a humanitarian corridor uh, here and there. Again, I just don't know. In the long term, of course, uh, the agency of the EU and NATO will be um, uh, supreme. Uh, they will have to deal with uh, rejigging the 
security architecture in Europe. Uh, I agree with Matthew that uh, Finland and Sweden are more than likely uh, to join. Uh, the Euroforce may again be resuscitated uh, as an appendage or a rapid deployment force uh, at the disposal of uh, uh, NATO, but it's, it's a matter of uh, years. It's not like uh, material to the immediate uh, cessation of violence. Thank you. Thanks. A um, few questions about uh, who is next in Russia's war of aggression. Would it be Moldova? Would it be one of the other countries in Central Asia? Who, who is next, next on the chart of the imperial um, expansion? And um, a few colleagues are asking this question time again. Uh, if um, Ukraine approached NATO and asked for help, military help directly, do you think that NATO would say no? Wouldn't they send some help? Send some, um, help? Um, I've got so many questions here. Um, uh, Kirill and Matthew, could you please answer them briefly and then I can take you through so that I can be fair to everyone. And whoever is online, please uh, feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask a question directly. Thank you. Um, okay, will NATO help in terms of boots on the ground? No. Uh, Zelensky asked, in fact, uh, and uh, his press conference that he just held today said, uh, I asked all 27, you know, um, 27 countries, what are you going to do? And I received silence back. Um, so I dare say he will probably have, um, you know, he'll, he'll get sold javelins and stingers um, and, uh, you know, non-lethal uh, equipment as aid by various NATO members. Um, including the United States. Australia has said we will provide non-lethal aid to uh, Kiev. Um, but uh, that's going to probably be more important for, you know, resistance uh, rather than uh, in the aftermath of the conflict, um, the, the main hostilities, that is, than, than in the current phase. Um, as to who's next, that's a favourite game of uh, Russian strategic policy and, uh, you know, politics watchers. Where does Putin go next? Um I always thought it was going to be North Kazakhstan after Nazarbayev died. I was wrong about that. Um, but, you know, right more recently in the sort of CSTO uh, context where, you know, you had uh, peacekeepers going in very, very briefly, you know, to clean up the streets of uh, the, 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 terribly, <laughs> the terribly volatile streets of Kazakhstan, which is really just a sort of power play purge. Um, Where's he go next? To, he may go to Transnistria and Moldova. Uh, Biden has been hinting that might, might be what he wants. Um, I suppose my perspective on, uh, and it depends whether or not there is a diplomatic solution. And, and here I'd probably disagree a bit with Kirill in terms of, uh, you know, a diplomatic angel. Um, I, I just don't see how a diplomatic, what a diplomatic angel has to broker. Because the question Putin has posed is, or demand he's made is, wind back the security system that was put in place beginning in 1993, 1994. And that's completely unacceptable uh, to the West. And they're not going to say yes to that. And they're not going to blink to it. And they're not going to bring in new institutions for new realities. I've been reading that since 1991. Um, so therefore, it is uh, whatever, you know, the outcome of the conflict will be and whatever attitude the United States and NATO takes to, to Russia in uh, uh, text to Russia in future. I imagine that, uh, you know, the die is cast now and no one will believe Putin ever again in the West. Um, and uh, he will turn himself into, you know, a complete pariah from that region of the world for probably the rest of his time in office. Right. Thank you, yeah. Kirill. All right. Well, I can just second Matthew's emphatic no. NATO will not help in any form or shape uh, militarily. Uh, as to who's next, uh, my hunch is nobody, uh, provided that uh, uh, they are on good behavior as far as Moscow is concerned. They toe the line. They acknowledge that uh, Moscow has uh, uh, security, um, uh, national security interests to pursue on their sovereign territories, i.e. abstain from getting too close to uh, with the West and God forbid to join NATO. So uh, Georgia has been on good behavior since 2008, well really since 2010, since Saakashvili 
uh, went. So nobody talks about uh, Georgia succumbing to the uh, clutches of the bear. Um, uh, even under the new government in Moldova, uh, Sandu said, uh, look, uh, we're taking a pause in terms of our deliberations on NATO membership. Uh, fine, the Russians said, okay, well, we can uh, deal with this. And of course, uh, just a couple of days ago, well, just as Putin was making an announcement about the recognition of uh, uh, Donbass, uh, the Azeri president came on a, a visit to Moscow and uh, they, they hit it famously with Putin and uh, uh, Alif said, well, Russia and Azerbaijan are like this, uh, strategic partners uh, and all that, uh, because uh, Alif apparently made uh, a comment that uh, our rapprochement with Turkey will not progress beyond limits that are acceptable to uh, Russia. So something like this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I've got, I'm trying to um, syncretize the question so that I, I don't repeat the same thing to you. Who would uh, Putin listen to? Who you think would be apart from the rich uh, uh, Russian cronies and possibly China? Uh, is there anybody else who could do the um, diplomatic bid? Um, and do you think that this war will turn up into a guerrilla war um, that will tear apart um, not only Ukraine, but also the um, Eurasian um, region itself? And if Putin fail in this mission, um, do you think Ukraine could join or would be encouraged to join NATO given what we've been covering so far? Um, Matthew? Okay. Um, who does Putin listen to? Putin listens to Putin. Um, he, in the past, has sometimes listened to Sechin. He sometimes, in the past, has listened to you know other members of his uh, inner circle. Uh, but I think he sees himself as the best arbiter of what is right and uh, what is wrong uh, for Russia. I think he views himself very much as you know the the only one who's got the the uh, the answers. Um, increasingly, I think, uh, you know, uh, looking at perhaps his legacy or, you know, his view that um, whoever replaces him won't be able to do as good a job. Um, does he listen to Xi? Well, I would have thought that China would probably tell him, have told him not to invade uh, Ukraine. And uh, uh, he certainly uh, went ahead and did that. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, I don't think there is anyone else who will sway Putin. Um, and if you look at his Security Council uh, meeting, where he put everybody on notice, where he, uh, you know, basically uh, slapped down Lavrov, where Medvedev had to uh, turn himself into a hardliner, uh, where, you know, he completely humiliated Narishkin, uh, the head of the SVR, uh, he was certainly sending the message that I am in complete control. Whether that continues, if, you know, the inner circle decides, well, you know, the old man's getting a bit crazy, um, uh, I don't know. I think they're all very terrified of him, and I don't think that they would move against him. Um, will it turn into a guerrilla war? Uh, definitely. Uh, in Ukraine, um, broader Eurasia, probably not. Um, the, uh, the, the, spillover, um, the spillover possibilities really aren't there unless you get spillover to, say, Romania or perhaps Moldova. Um, but yeah, I think definitely there will be some kind of uh, attempt by uh, Ukrainians, whether they live in Donetsk or Luhansk, uh, or if it is regime change, um, you know, um, in places in the north and in Kiev, uh, to uh, to bleed Russia as much as possible. Carol? All right, so uh, to whom does Putin listen? I don't want to sound banal or controversial, but uh, Putin does listen to the Russian people, at least from time to time. He is not as omnipotent and uh, all-knowing as uh, the Western media portrays him. Um, uh, I cannot provide you an example of Putin changing his foreign policy uh, as a result of uh, demotic pressure, but uh, more certainly domestically, it uh, happens all the time. And uh, right about now, uh, for example, there is a third round of the uh, pension reform in Russia. So social spending is about to be cut. Putin is absolutely terrified 
about this. Uh, the largest demonstrations in Russian history that came very nearly to upsetting the balance of power occurred not in uh, support of Alexei Navalny or some noble moral cause. It was always about pensions. It was all about cutting uh, uh, welfare benefits uh, to the Russian population. So thus, uh, if uh, that uh, groundswell of public opinion will come to bear upon Putin, where people really feel the pinch, well, that would be um, uh, a cause for him to act. Uh, guerrilla war in uh, Ukraine. Oh, absolutely. Uh, hypothetical. And again, I'm not sure this is going to happen. Uh, Putin occupies Ukraine. There will be guerrilla movement, freedom fighters uh, all over. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the worst case scenario because uh, there are plenty of Putin loyalists in Ukraine. Uh, Quislings or fifth columnists, uh, uh, just think about this. Ukrainians killing Ukrainians and Putin resides over it. It's, it's uh, not an optimal uh, solution and must be avoided at all costs, really. Thank you. Um, Sam, um, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just interested, we've, we've, there's been some, uh, we've heard a denial of, you know, we can't psychoanalyze Putin and um, he's, he does listen to some people, there's some sort of democratic thing, but I'm interested in whether we know, we've learned anything about the kind of processes of decision-making um, in the Kremlin, or maybe it's just confirmed or we already knew. Um, yeah, so just a question is about the kind of decision-making processes and whether we've learned anything about that. Matthew? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, uh, I mean, I, I've been looking at Russia for a while and even as it trended anti-democratic in the last Yeltsin years and then certainly under the Putin years, um, there is a form of institutional bargaining that takes place. Uh, in terms of decision making in the Russian Federation, um, particularly when it comes to things like investment, because uh, investment funds have been scarce, uh, opening up the Far East, for instance, and uh, and the energy sector, the power of Siberia two plants. Now, typically, it is, of course, uh, both the oligarchs and those who are developing gas, you know, gas pipelines uh, and gas fields that get the funding, rather than those you know, who are asking for funding for schools, for infrastructure, for follow-on services and so forth. So um, in, in terms of the way this plays out or the mechanics of the way that, uh, you know, bureaucratic politics plays out in Russia, there is a form of consent, uh, well, if not consensus, then bargaining and winners and losers, and they go through a process. Security affairs, you know, supposedly do the same thing within the context of the Security Council. But then again, it does depend very much on the gravity of the matter, uh, how much Putin is invested, um, and where different Kremlin tribes are at a particular time. So, for instance, um, the FSB used to be absolutely supreme in terms of, you know, uh, its influence over decision making on security affairs. Um, then there was an internal ruckus, and uh, Shoigu in particular. Um, had to hold back the tide. And, you know, the, the, the word was that, hang on, the armed forces are not getting the credit that they're due. So uh, Shoigu, uh, you know, was, was kind of elevated. This is Putin's strategy, however. He keeps some up, some down, and keeps them all on their toes. I think the one thing we do have to be very careful about is this notion that Putin decides everything in Russia. It's absolutely not the case. He decides the overall strategic direction. Um, and also when there are problems, um, he uh, works out what the solution is. Um, so the decision-making process for something like, you know, shall we recognize Luhansk and Donetsk? Uh, obviously, that is something that does come from Putin. Um, and in fact, if you looked at some of the, you know, not just metadata, but some of the eagle-eyed uh, photos of watches, both Putin's watches and the watches of those in his security council at that meeting, uh, it does look as though he signed the decree to, uh, or at least, yes, the, the signed the decree to uh, recognize uh, Luhansk and Donetsk before that meeting had even taken place. So that kind of undercuts the idea that there is, you know, institutional bargaining over such an important thing. But over other aspects of policy, there most certainly is. Thank you. Kirill? So, uh, Sam, I will uh, approach your question from a slightly different perspective. Uh, Matthew covered the institutional 
aspects of decision making brilliantly. Uh, but uh, I would like to use uh, two adjectives. It's uh, uh, dynamic and interactive. So um, uh, to say that Putin has some amazing grand plan would be an absolute misreading of the situation. Uh, it's uh, flexible. And uh, I dare say that uh, even uh, two weeks ago, a plausible outcome in Ukraine without this violence, without this war, uh, would have been possible. Um, uh, Putin sent, well, the Russian foreign policy establishment, uh, spearheaded of all things, the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, sent out a fila to the West and to Ukraine, uh, because it's the communists who initiated the bill in the Russian Duma to recognize Donetsk and uh, Luhansk. Uh, zero reaction, aha, uh -huh. well, let's uh, take it on board, let's escalate it uh, a bit further. So thus, uh, uh, what Putin thinks or does to today may not be reflective of how he used to think uh, or what he did uh, maybe um, a year or two uh, before. And of course, Lavrov is on record on so many occasions saying uh, Minsk process, Russia recognizes total sovereignty of Ukraine and uh, uh, we swear by it, oh, well, it, it all changed uh, quite uh, dramatically. So uh, the um, uh, final bit here is, uh, of course, the process is Byzantine. It's not uh, transparent at all. Uh, but recall, it's, it's Churchill who used that metaphor. It's uh, an enigma wrapped in a mystery and so on and so forth. But then Churchill finished that quote with uh, his, uh, his own approach that it's all about the national interest. Uh, so the national interest is well articulated. It has been constant uh, for maybe uh, 15 years now. It's just the ways uh, this uh, national interest is achieved vary quite considerably. It's unsituational. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Carol Matthew. So uh, two more um, questions that I see recurrent in the chat box. One about Australia. Um, we've seen Scott Morrison condemning in the strongest term the invasion of Ukraine. Do you think Australia will send troops? What do you think the position of Australia will be given that it's offering aid to Ukraine? So that's one question. The other one, going back to my favorite region, the Middle East, I mean, Russia has messed up Syria a big time. I mean, they've destroyed the country. They propped up um, a brutal regime of um, Assad, and nobody took notice of that. They're only taking notice now that it's invading um, uh, Ukraine. How do you think that venture in the Middle East affected Russia flexing its muscle and gaining more confidence in um, Eurasian and in, 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 in its own surrounding region. And second, how do you see the role of Turkey and Iran? They're both in very tricky positions. Turkey is a member of NATO, but it's also a good friend in a kind of um, on and off way with, with Russia because they buy arms uh, from Russia, they are try they are really not happy with the West. They turn to Russia, so it's very hard for them to condemn. They're keeping a very neutral, almost neutral, but quite a subtle way of um, making comments about the situation. Iran is even worse because. Um, uh, the Iranians have a very tricky situation with the Americans. They want to go back to the nuclear program discussion, but they don't want to upset Russia. So how do you see this, this is playing out in this particular region as well? Thank you both. Hey, Kirill, do you want to do the Middle East, Turkey, and I'll do Australia? Uh, uh, sure, absolutely. Um, uh, so first, Syria and how it affected uh, the situation in Ukraine. Uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, for me, the Russia's involvement in Syria since uh, 2015 is uh, a clear-cut case of, uh, again, it's a security-driven uh, process. It's not about uh, standing up to America and uh, restoring uh, the Soviet Union's global outreach. Uh, Russia has clearly identified security interests. And uh, one of the um, uh, second tier security interests that uh, has been accomplished in Syria is uh, quite an extraordinary rate of rotation of the Russian military personnel through Syria. Pretty much uh, from the battalion level up, every Russian officer has been to Syria and done this and that. And uh, the reasonable precision of Russian strikes in uh, Ukraine uh, has been attributed, I saw some discussion on this uh, in the Russian uh, open sources, to the, the uh, well-trained uh, officer corps who had experienced uh, the delights of mass destruction in um, uh, uh, Syria. And of course, uh, uh, Bashar already said, look, uh, uh, no problem with recognition of Luhansk and Donetsk, all you need to do is uh, uh, to ask. So at least uh, a chink in the uh, 
a global outrage against uh, Putin's um, aggression. Uh, in terms of Turkey and Iran, I kind of uh, joked with a colleague uh, just this very mor uh, morning that Erdogan may be that angel, you know, who will come, who belongs to NATO, but also has good relations with, uh, um, reasonable relations with Putin. It's too frivolous. I don't want to probe uh, uh, any further. Of course, uh, Turkey now stands shoulder to shoulder with the rest of NATO in terms of castigating um, uh, Russia, but uh, Erdogan is quite capable of surprise. He's been around long enough and he's a master politician. Um, Iran, uh, Iran, uh, just like China, of course, uh, solidarized with Russia in terms of uh, labeling NATO an aggressive power, you know, uh, it has been reticent in terms of uh, the most recent um, uh, development, uh, but this is to add to an earlier question about uh, Russia and China and uh, Taiwan. Uh, lest we forget, it's all in the Pacific is also quite important. And in the re recent times, uh, the trilateral naval exercises have been held. So China, Russia, and uh, Iran, and uh, um, if the trend continues, they'll only get bigger and uh, better and more threatening to Australia, obviously. Thank you, Carol. Um, now, what does Australia do? Um, uh, well, um, look, obviously Australia is a bit player in all of this. Um, Ukraine is a long, long way away, and I think there's no surprise that um, there has been linkage uh, in terms of political, um, elected official, uh, elected uh, people, um, now drawing, you know, uh, comparisons between what Russia is doing and what China might do, uh, re reflecting Australia's own sort of security pathologies, I think. So, um, but that said, I, I do think it's important in a number of ways that we don't often focus on in relation to how Canberra sees its role in the world. Um, and the first one is that we have put an awful lot of store on the notion of values and principles and rules-based order and so forth and standing up to uh, authoritarian states, standing up to bullies, standing up for, uh, you know, those who are, are democratically elected. Um, so I think it's our response is actually quite important in that it's not just simply virtue signaling um, to the United States or to the European Union. But if you're actually going to have this as the bedrock or part of the bedrock of your foreign and security policy, then what happens in Ukraine is just as important as what happens in Taiwan or what happens in Myanmar uh, or what happens even closer to home. Um, so I think the, um, the issue of the, uh, the conflict in Ukraine is, is quite symbolically uh, important for Australia in terms of uh, walking the walk as well as talking the talk in its uh, in its sort of security affairs. Beyond that, yeah, we'll provide some non-lethal assistance to Ukraine. Apparently, we're going to be providing some cyber assistance too. Uh, obviously, we won't know what that is, uh, and uh, we'll probably never know what that is. Um, but uh, one would assume that uh, there will be sharing of intelligence, sharing of signals, sharing of intercepts, uh, possibly some offensive cyber by the black hats, uh, but again, uh, we just don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. So uh, possibly the last question, unless anybody wants to come in from the um, participant here, raised their hand and ask question. So it appears that Russia launched three types of war against um, Ukraine. One was a propaganda one about the fact that um, Ukraine is an artificial country. It doesn't have a national identity. It's so divided. Uh, ethnically and there is no real nation and apparently they pursue that quite um, passionately within Ukraine itself and also with the public in, in, in Russia. The second war was the cyber attacks. There were a series of cyber attacks that apparently has uh, caused a lot of havoc in Ukraine and of course the third one is the military one. How do you see the use of history, this divide and rule being pertinent to Ukraine? I mean, given that question of the Russian speaking um, minorities um, who apparently in my uh, understanding are, are define themselves as Ukraine, uh, but they are Russian speaking, you know, that diversity of the nation, which is very common in that part of the world. How do you see these three um, types of war interconnected and how, um, really, is this use of history to abuse and um, pursue this imperial ambition? Thank you very much. Um, I might just come in on the sort of information war side. Um, 
It's interesting that, you know, the, the typical target of information uh, war like this is um, effectively diaspora communities, right? Um, and of course, there's plenty of them. Whether, you, whether you're in Ukraine, you find plenty of those who would be Russian speakers, um, who increasingly less identify with themselves as Russian. Um, and in fact, you can make the same argument in, frankly, Abkhazia and South Ossetia too, with people who you know provided Russian passports and like, well, what am I going to do with this? Uh, I'm a Georgian, I'm a, I, but I speak Russian. Um, same thing with Estonia and so forth. Um, that's one aspect to Russia's information strategy, I think, directed uh, directly against Ukraine. But the other part of the information strategy um, is directed against disaffected people uh, in the West in particular. And that's been the most interesting development over the last you know, five, eight years or so, is that desire to reach out to people um, who feel that their government lies to them, their, the media lies to them, they've been left behind by globalization, uh, they have various other access to grind, and push this sort of narrative about ethnicity and culture and citizenship and frankly blood. Um, it, it's very much, a, I think, a racial argument that's being made that really does, I think, animate uh, uh, and bring together um, a lot of uh, those we associate particularly with the alt-right in the United States, but also the pro-Brexit Farage movement and uh, the British National Party and so on. Other groups, of course, uh, within Germany and France and so forth. So it is a message that is appealing because uh, it sort of harks back to what Huntington said uh, about civilizations. And uh, I certainly don't endorse the civilizational thesis, but he had an interesting thing to say about what makes people fight. Um, and uh, he said that faith and family and blood and belief are what people ultimately fight for and will die for. Uh, and I think that's been recognized very much by um, propagandists um, in the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, but also more broadly in the GIU and the S, uh, FSB and the SBR. Uh, and it's been weaponized quite successfully uh, more outside the immediate zone of conflict right now um, than, uh, than necessarily within it. Well, essentially, all history writing is political. Uh, we all know this, uh, but some countries uh, weaponize history more efficiently uh, than others. And of course, uh, Matthew already uh, went through the main points in Putin's uh, idiosyncratic uh, historical uh, speech. Uh, my reading of it is uh, slightly different. I think he was uh, actually uh, targeting domestic audiences, the Russians themselves, uh, uh, trying to explain why his own uh, Ukraine policy has been such a disaster so far. In that very speech, he uh, disclosed the fact that uh, since independence, Russia had plonked $250 billion into Ukraine through subsidized gas prices mostly. So thus the Russians may ask a legitimate question, and, and we are at war, what, what gives and how come? And Putin shifts the blame, of course, on Lenin. It's, even in my infinite wisdom, I could not overcome that horrible legacy, the mistakes uh, Lenin had uh, created. So, um, uh, of course, uh, the Russian propaganda uses a lot of uh, historical anecdotes, tropes, and uh, uh, narratives, but uh, uh, the reverse is actually quite true as well. Uh, not everything that comes from Ukraine by way of this uplifting national discourse is uh, factually correct or um, uh, benign. Uh, suffice it to say, look, uh, again, I have to be very careful about what I'm saying. I'm not exonerating Putin at all. I think he made a huge mistake and this war is absolutely disgusting. Uh, but uh, the Ukrainian government has its own share of mistakes, uh, including uh, abuse of history. Uh, well, uh, the post-Maidan government, not Zelensky, but his predecessors uh, uh, habitually referred to Russophonic people in the east of Ukraine as uh, untermenschen and uh, uh, deformed creatures uh, not worthy of living in Ukraine. Um, so Zelensky, of course, has rectified those mistakes, but uh, people remember, and uh, uh, there is a residual sympathy in, you know, in the uh, to the east of the Dnieper uh, towards uh, the Putin narrative that oh my God, you know, uh, all those neo Nazis coming from the west uh, of Ukraine are oppressing you, are squeezing you out of your um, comfortable cultural uh, space. So uh, dangerous games. Everyone plays uh, history. Uh, wars, but perhaps uh, Putin has weaponized it more successfully 
than others. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to give you a break. Uh, Matthew and Kirill, we grilled you for an hour and a half. Um, that was um, incredibly sophisticated. Thank you so much for answering all our questions. And thank you to all atten attendants. Um, this will be posted on our website as well as on YouTube in due time. Uh, I wish to end by expressing our solidarity with the Ukraine people and hoping that um, things will be resolved in the best possible way. And Kirill, I really buy into your theory that Erdogan can be the angel of peace in this case. So let's hope for the best. Thank you all very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.